Welcome to this time capsule interview of Jim Rice. Jim is Malincrup Professor of Engineering Sciences and Geophysics at Harvard University. The time capsule is sponsored by Interpor, the International Society for Porous Media. These time capsules are interviews of eminent researchers who've played a major role in the science and technology of porous media. I'm John Rudnicki from Northwestern University, where I'm Professor of Mechanical Engineering and of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Jim and I are at the Hauser Studio within the Media Production Center at Harvard. We'll be talking about Jim's life and work so far and his vision for the future. So Jim, let's start at the beginning. You were born in Frederick, Maryland. That's right. What was it like growing up there in the 40s and 50s? I don't remember, actually, <laughs> in the okay. 40s. <laughs> but the, uh, the 50s uh, more comes into view, yeah. <laughs> comes into memory. It was a small town, but uh, uh, an interesting, historically important town. It's where Francis Scott Key was from, the fellow who wrote mm -hmm. the U.S. National Anthem. And, Others, uh, other famous figures, but uh, it was a, a smallish town, probably population around 20,000 or, or so when I grew up, and uh, it was a friendly town. I, I liked it. Was there something that uh, made you want to become a scientist and engineer that happened in the early life? Uh, I can't point to a single event, but, but in uh, our high school uh, where I went to, it was a a church high school run by uh, uh, nuns from the local Catholic mm -hmm. church. But none of them, or almost none of them, were proficient in science, and they hired our science teachers from a major army lab, which was in that same town, a place called Fort Detrick. And uh, I got turned on by the lectures on physics and chemistry and calculus and so forth that we were getting, which were sort of outside of the normal curriculum. and, and these fields just excited me, so I figured, well, that's probably what I should work in. Okay, so in 1958, you went to Lehigh, mm -hmm. uh, stayed for your bachelor's degree, and then also for your master's and PhD. Uh, what was your experience like there? Very good. I, I liked Lehigh from the first time I visited. It's on a hillside, and, and uh, I was just awestruck uh, uh, when I saw uh, the buildings like James Packard Laboratory where you kind of see mechanical contraptions over decades uh, on display, cars and other uh, engines, jet engines, other devices, and uh, uh, Fritz Lab where they have the monstrous testing uh, uh, mm -hmm. machines. So it just seemed to be an interesting place for a guy with, who thought he might be interested in engineering. Then you moved on to Brown as a postdoc. That's right. That's and right. became regular faculty and moved up through the ranks. What was the atmosphere of Brown like at that time? Well, when I arrived, uh, Brown was unfortunately in the midst of a sort of fragmentation, and, and several very senior people had left and unhappy. It never, I never quite understood what motivated the breakup. But nevertheless, uh, in years uh, after I arrived, we began to have a stream of very fortunate hires, and the place became quite lively. Uh, people such as uh, Pedro Marçal, uh, 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 Alan Needleman, uh, others, Rod Clifton, arrived the same time I did. So Brown replenished itself, and uh, in the years I was there, I think we were a very collegial place. People enjoyed one another's company, respected one another, so it, it worked well. And in 1981, you moved on to Harvard. What influenced your decision to move? Well, the opportunity to be in, involved both in the departments of um, applied science or engineering sciences and in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences there I had some informal affiliation like that at, at Brown uh, with Earth and Planetary Sciences, but, but it was a, a fuller one at Harvard, and that appealed to me. And, and, so, and also, I had very good relations with people uh, who I knew well there, Bernie Budiansky, now deceased, George Carrier, also deceased, 
John Hutchinson, fortunately not, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and others. So, so it was a friendly atmosphere, and, and uh, also I knew a lot of folks nearby at MIT, too, mm -hmm. Frank McClintock, L.A. Argonne, and others. So it just seemed like a receptive place. Now, in your earlier years, you worked mainly in fracture mechanics and plasticity. You continued that work, but uh, in the mid to late 70s, you got interested in porous media. I think uh, initially in uh, failure of overconsolidated clay slopes. What uh, stimulated your interest in porous media, and what were some of your early contributions in that area? Well, okay, so a pivotal figure there was a man named Andrew Palmer, mm -hmm. uh, who was a professor at Cambridge University in the UK. And uh, Andrew saw some of the ways I was addressing cracks and fracture, the path-independent integral around crack tips, and wondered if it might have application to landslides and clay slopes. And indeed, we worked together on that, and it did have such application, and we published a, a paper on that, which has been moderately well-cited since. But then that also got us, uh, me interested in something that Andrew constantly talked about, the role of fluids in the subsurface and pore pressure. So I decided I have to learn about that, and I did learn <laughs> <laughs> okay. about that, as you well know, through mm. several theses subsequently sponsored at, at, at Brown uh, and, and so forth. So, um, and it excited me, the idea that uh, uh, fluid pressures in the subsurface were very important for the stability of material, for example, against shear localization, mm -hmm. as you and I worked on, but more generally for the frictional resistance to seismic rupture. So it just seemed like an interesting area to get into. So I was first brought into this domain of poro mechanics through an interest in the role of pore fluids and failure processes in the earth. But then subsequently I got more fully drawn into hydrology uh, at Harvard for about 10 years. I taught the main hydrology course that we have for advanced undergrads and, and willing graduate students. Uh -huh. And uh, when I didn't teach that course because we had other young professors on campus who were interested in, in doing hydrology too, so I, I happily stepped aside, but I taught other courses and uh, with names like environmental geomechanics, which had a substantial hydrological input. So I ended up uh, starting with fracture and clay slopes and Andrew Palmer and ending up being pretty heavily into the effects of water on earth processes and hydrology in general. So, of course, a, a big focus in the effect of water on earth processes uh, which developed shortly after that time was the revolution in hydraulic fracturing. Mm -hmm. And that inevitably dragged me even further into this domain. Uh, I had many interactions early in that time with people at Schlumberger, uh, 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 first with a, a lab in Oklahoma run by a man named Jean-Claude Rogier, and he attracted very bright people from France, from Belgium. Some of them have gone on to quite productive uh, uh, careers since. Uh, Emmanuel de Tournay is in Minnesota, who we both know yes. is, is one, and, and there are many others. And uh, that also got me involved then with the Schlumberger lab in Cambridge, England, and subsequently with one in, in Cambridge, Mass., but I think perhaps uh, I'm perceived nowadays as too much of a skeptic about that <laughs> yeah. area, so I don't get so many invitations, <laughs> but <laughs> they may, uh, may be unrelated events. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So in the subsequent years, you worked an awful lot on earthquakes. Yeah. That's a big area. You made many contributions, but can you say something about your work in that area? Yes, I did work on earthquakes, but... Uh, it also typically had a hydrologic component to it in that very often we were concerned with issues of, of uh, fluid pore pressures that were induced owing to rupture processes at the tips of advancing shear ruptures uh, uh, in uh, earthquakes. But I, my interest in earthquakes became broader than, than that, and uh, uh, a lot of the work was done, some with uh, uh, my wife, Renata Demofska, on uh, 
uh, earthquake processes and subduction zones and some with uh, a host of, of students. I think you were the first student to work on <laughs> earthquakes. <laughs> and, but there were many, many subsequent, mm -hmm. as, as you know. Later, you returned to hydraulic fracture and talked about the hydrology of ice sheets. Uh, yes, yes. Well, water is an interesting substance. It's everywhere. <laughs> uh, yes. And in particular, uh, it's, it gets under ice sheets. We think it's critical to the, uh, the way that ice streams, for example, off the Western Antarctic ice sheet, as also off the Greenland ice sheet. But as the ice moves on this, these ice sheets, gravitationally pulled towards the surrounding seas, the ice deforms. And often, particularly in Western Antarctica, um, the evidence suggests that the ice gets warm enough at the margins of those fast-flowing streams that you reach melting temperatures locally. So the flowing ice exudes liquid water as it goes, and, and that uh, water under pressure entering the subsurface, which is old ocean floor, clay-rich material, that weakens just like any soil would weaken when you uh, uh, subject it to high pore pressure, and this aids the, uh, the flow process. So we, we kind of translated knowledge from engineering uh, rock and soil mechanics and hydrology to, to the glacial scale in that. Okay. And we're not alone. A lot of other folks are, <laughs> yeah. are applying that trade, too. Now, another area that involves hydrology quite a bit, and I know you've been working in this area recently, is uh, induced seismicity, a yes. big topic because of the large um, increase in earthquakes in central United States. Yeah. What are you doing in there? Well, it's, um, it, as I said earlier, hy hydraulic fracture was an um, important early draw for me into that area. Uh, I think I've maybe lost a few friends or <laughs> <laughs> be, because I, I suppose I've uh, become a bit skeptical about the wisdom of, of many uh, uh, cases of practice of hydraulic fracture, often inadvertent practices because people inject fluids freely into the crust without understanding that there is the possibility of inducing earthquakes, but, but often that is the unfortunate outcome. So I think we, I think the contribution made through hydraulic fracture to uh, giving us uh, increased access to energy resources, gas, oil, I think that's an important contribution, but I, I do think we have to look very carefully at the process at the cost, try to find ways of figuring out whether we are in areas where induction of seismic events is likely or, or not, and uh, in general to have better monitoring and, and better uh, emergency responses if things go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so have you worked on uh, many problems, many different areas? What's guided your choice of those problems? They had to be interesting, and, and uh, uh, of, of course, that's a very personal thing. Yeah, what's interesting well, to you, what's interesting <laughs> to me, they need not be the same. Uh, I had to feel that they were kind of important issues and that there was something left to say in, in those domains. Uh, often one misjudges that because when you get into a new field, you have no idea of how much was actually yeah. done and done. Uh, known already, and there's a lot of rediscovery of the wheel that inevitably goes mm -hmm. on on the way in. But, but uh, in general, is it what looked interesting and uh, important from uh, either a scientific or a, uh, importance of the application standpoint. The research landscape has changed quite a bit over your career. Uh, what do you see as the biggest changes and? Is there some advice you can give to younger researchers navigating the current landscape? The only advice I could give to them is they should have been born about 30 years <laughs> earlier. <early. laughs> <laughs> because it was a marvelous way through, and I suspect it's going to stay rough for 
some time. It, it obviously depends on who is in charge at a national level of, of the government and what goals are, are set and, and so forth, and the hostility to science versus receptivity to science and public policy making and, and so forth. You've had many accomplishments. Are there some that you're particularly proud of or that stand out in your mind? I, I wouldn't like to play favorites. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to uh, impact fracture mechanics when then that era was relatively young in the same way I've been happy with the modest influence we've had in the hydrologic area. It's something I got into quite unexpectedly, starting with cracks, translating that to landslides, learning about poor yeah. pressure, and one thing led to another. Yeah. <laughs> um, for a, a good bit of my work, too, I, I worked on uh, what might be called materials physics, but trying to look at microscopic processes of deformation, especially in metals and sometimes in ceramics and connecting them to macroscopic behavior. But I think that's probably a done chapter and I suspect what efforts I have left will probably be uh, uh, dedicated to problems like earthquakes, landslides, hydrologic processes and the way uh, pore fluids interact with things like ice sheets clay slopes and so forth. So do you see those as the major outstanding problems in poral mechanics or are there others you'd want to mention? Uh, they're the ones that I feel I might be able to get my arms around uh -huh. but <laughs> I, okay. I wouldn't, I, I haven't thought about that as sort of in, in terms of value to the field, how should we uh, rate these? Yeah. How about you? What do you think? You're, you've made distinguished contributions to that area. Well, I, I don't know either. I, <laughs> I, I, I keep thinking that biological materials are interesting, porous media yes. materials, but I haven't done anything. Yeah. Well, of course, biology is the big revolution that's sweeping through engineering and applied science, and I've stayed orthogonal to that. It, it just never caught my fancy, but if you go to almost any door in the building I sit in at Harvard, you knock on the office door and say, are you guys doing anything involving biology? The answer would be yes, and that would be in the main building of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh -huh. So biology has uh, become, a, and, and medicine have, have become big, big parts of modern engineering science. And I think it's an important development, a laudable one, but I've been completely orthogonal to it, and uh, I, I think that will more and more probably occupy our, our successors mm -hmm. as far as things they choose to work on. Now, you've had many collaborators, and you already mentioned one that I think is special, uh, Renata Damowska. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about that collaboration over the years? Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, Renata. Uh, came to Harvard uh, uh, as a postdoctoral visitor with a uh, strong interest and commitment already to seismology. She had worked with Boris Kostrov, a famous mechanician in Russia, on some problems of, of crack mechanics and, and uh, uh, the like. And uh, the area she specialized on uh, in her time at Harvard was uh, subduction zones, great subduction earthquakes around the world. Um, and then uh, in more recent times, she became uh, totally dedicated to trying to resurrect the world's oldest geophysical journal, Pure and Applied Geophysics, uh -huh. from an obscurity that it fell into. And, and most of her energies have gone into trying to make that journal run, trying to uh, draft uh, to their services, good people to serve as associate editors in different domains, and especially she's taken control of putting together topical special issues on different areas in, in geophysics, be they uh, oceanography, earth, solid earth, earthquake, uh, 
uh, atmosphere type things. So that's uh, been her preoccupation, putting together special issues that are uh, publications of, of the journal Pure and Applied Geophysics. Are there any other comments that you'd like to make? No, it's been good fun. I've had many, many uh, delightful colleagues, and I've enjoyed every moment of it. It can't go on forever, but I wish it could. <laughs> uh -huh. Thanks for sitting for this interview, Jim. It's been fascinating to me, and I'm sure it will be to many people. I know it will be inspiring to many young researchers. So thank you again. Well, thanks for having me, John, and thank you for uh, the, all of these years of close friendship, scientific collaboration, and uh, it's been a wonderful time. I, I recall it all with warm memories. <laughs> well, thank you. I've enjoyed it, too. And thanks to Interpore for making this interview possible.